and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm just thinking about that song, Overwhelmed, and thinking about the fact that uh, our own Dave Ankney is doing a 100-mile run this weekend. I'd be overwhelmed at this point, but he's in the last leg, apparently. So we're going to pray for him later on in the service this morning to, to complete that. But uh, my goodness gracious, that's, uh, that's diligence, I'll tell you. It really is. I um, want to share some announcements with you this morning. Uh, please note a number of things uh, coming up today. Uh, we have the, uh, the Lenten Soup and Supper, which is taking place at 5 o'clock today. I will be teaching um, our final devotion for, for the Lenten season. So come on by for, uh, I believe it's a sandwich today. Soup and a sandwich, is that right, Cindy? Soup and a sandwich today. So uh, no soup, just sandwiches. No soup, just sandwiches. Sandwiches and what else? Brownies, sandwiches and brownies. Hey, you got to come here today for that. Okay, we have um, we have a mission committee and Christian Ed committee meeting on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, we also have on Wednesday our usual programs going on. Uh, please note too, this is the second last um, Alpha class that will be taking place. So continue to pray for them. Uh, also, we have uh, Epic taking place on Thursday. Please note in the bull in the bulletin and in the, in the uh, announcements all the circles that are meeting uh, this week too. And uh, we want to have an announcement about the prayer vigil. And Cindy, if I could get you on the microphone since we have some people online today too. There we go. Our prayer vigil takes place from Good Friday night to Sunday morning, and we need 15 more people. We needed 36, so we're more than halfway there. But you just pray at home on your own. Um, and we have a paper of prayers that you can pray for, but you can set your alarm, get up in the middle of the night. One hour goes really fast, so <laughs> don't be shy. 15 more spots. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much, Cindy. And Dawn has some announcement about, about egging. Here we go. Yes. Good morning. So we have Palm Sunday coming up next week and then the week of Holy Week before Resurrection Sunday. So Egging Houses is back. The egging kits are out on the table. They have, some of them have the yellow slips of names and addresses for our Awana and church families. And there's some bags out there that do not have the address on them. But if you have a neighbor or um, somebody that you know, a family that you would like to egg their house, uh, the egging includes you pick up this bag, put the 12 eggs out in their yard, hang the bag on their door, and it invites them to all of the services during Holy Week and the Easter egg hunt on Saturday. It's just a fun outreach. They also get candy, but not only that, the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem through his resurrection is hidden in the eggs as well. So they get the story of Jesus' resurrection. So there's 40-some I do not care to do all of them on my own next week, so please stop by, look at the addresses. It's a beautiful day today. You could do it on your way home from church. If you're passing by somebody's house, you can stop and egg their house. Perfect. Thanks That's for your help. Oh, thank you very much for that. Um, we have some spaces that have opened up for the uh, trip to see the production of uh, Sight and Sound Theater's Daniel. So uh, please see Lee and Dawn about that. Some, a couple of spots have opened up for that. Uh, Mission Committee would like to thank everybody for their donations of hygiene products for the City Rescue Mission. Thank you for that. Uh, please note that uh, next Sunday, Palm Sunday, from uh, 12, 15 to 3, I'll be hosting a new members class. We have a few individuals signed up for that already. If you would like to participate, please call the church office and get yourself on for that as well. Also next Saturday is the church cleanup day. Uh, that begins at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it includes the church grounds and uh, things that may need to be fixed or replaced inside the, uh, inside the church as well. Also have uh, Scott Phillips with an announcement as well from our fish fry that took place uh, this past Friday and also the Friday before that. It was a lot of fun this week. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank everybody that came and got fish dinners and supported us. Uh, we did 80 dinners again this week. Um, we have some frozen fish and we have macaroni and cheese and brownies left over that we'd like to sell. The fish is $2 a piece, which recovers our cost for it. Um, we'll be in the kitchen. Somebody will be in the kitchen between the services and after the second service. So if you'd like to buy some fish, you can. We deep fried it, but it, I have instructions in there off the box. You can bake it. You can air fry it however you want to want to do it but we'd appreciate to get it sold thank you all right thank you any more announcements for the good of the body while i am st standing here with the microphone 
Uh, all right, uh, Gary, Gary too. So Doug first, then Gary. And I'll walk it over to you. How's that sound? <laughs> Good morning. Just to follow up what Scott said, thank you for all the people that helped or that donated their time to help with the fish fry, uh, the baking of the brownies, and for Gail and Scott for bringing their trailer here that we could use this to the monies we make. We should come out roughly if you guys buy everything in there. <laughs> uh, total profit after should be 1600 and some dollars that we can use for the body of Christ here to, to serve our missionaries however we see fit to use. Also, thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. I also wanted to say our meeting, mission meeting Tuesday night, is we're going to Game Changers down Newcastle at the Old Town Mall. It's, um, she's actually going to be speaking here at the church following Sunday after Easter, I believe. But we're going down as a mission committee. We're going to take the van, have our meeting in the van on the way down. But we wanted to open it up to anyone in the church. If you would like to go down, we're just going to take a tour of the whole facility down there and what she, what all she does down there for the community. We are going to leave here about 6.15 um, and meet down there at 6.30 on Tuesday night. So anyone's more than welcome to go. All right, thank you very much. All right, we're going to walk it over to you. Look, what a nice guy I am. I'm walking it completely over to you here. Uh, I, didn't, I did not mention session meeting. Session meeting is Thursday night yep. early because of Easter, and if you've got time this week uh, and want to pick up sticks in the yard, they're calling for a bunch of snow Fridays. So oh, really? Um, we might get it not, but. Anytime you want to stop over, pick up sticks, pile them up, we can get them later, but we want to get ready for the Easter egg hunt uh, the following Saturday. Right, great. Thank you very much. I didn't realize it was going to snow. Thanks for the great news. Really appreciate that. <laughs> That's awesome. Any more announcements while well, I have the microphone in my hand? Yes, Cindy, one more? Ah, yes, uh, the, uh, the Seder dinner. Um, we're going to be doing something for Monday, Thursday, which is a little bit different this year. Uh, we're going to be doing a Passover Seder. Uh, an official Passover Seder. Uh, Mitch Tepper, who's preached here before, uh, is going to be uh, joining me for that. He's going to be walking us through uh, a traditional Passover Seder, but pointing to Jesus the whole way because, of course, he's a Messianic Jew who believes that Jesus is our Savior. So he's going to kind of marry it together, and that'll be also this, celebrating the Sacrament of Communion that night too, celebrating it within the Passover uh, within the Passover meal, and you'll see how that all ties in. It's really, really exciting. So we encourage you to to come by. And do we want sign-ups for that too, Cindy? Yeah, is there a sign-up out there for it? Yeah, please sign up because we need to f figure out how many uh, items we need to make to, or to bring uh, as part of this part of the Seder. So please sign up for that just to give us a rough idea of account for that. I don't think there are any other announcements now, so let's uh, let's pray and prepare our hearts for worship. Lord, we're grateful today to come into your house and to worship you. And uh, Lord God, we're coming from many places, lots of stuff going on in, uh, in our lives and the lives of this church as we just saw this morning. And so Lord, we wanna stop and we wanna pause now uh, to just acknowledge what this is all about, the reason why we're all here, which is you, Lord Jesus, and what you did for us, what we celebrate during the season of Lent. And so this prayer today, Lord, come Holy Spirit, fill our lives, Fill this church that we might worship you with everything that you deserve. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. And let us stand now for the call to worship. Uh, we are adapting this this morning from Micah uh, chapter 6 from the Old Testament. And let's say this together. With what shall we come before you, Lord? How shall we bow down before you, O exalted God? Praise to you, Lord, for showing us what is good. Praise to you, Lord, for showing what you require to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly before you, God. We worship you. Let us worship God. I come to the cross seeking mercy and grace. Come. 
come to church today, there are burdens that some are carrying here today. May they be able to lay them, Lord, at your feet, knowing that this is, this is, Lord, the place where we need to be today to worship you, to feel your presence of your Holy Spirit. But Lord, we also do know as well that you're preparing a place for all who believe in you in eternity, where there'll be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears. As we continue to worship you today, Lord, we reflect upon the pathway that you've opened for us in eternity, in heaven. In your name, Jesus, we worship you and pray to you. Amen. Sometimes it feels like I'm watching from the outside. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing. But am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers that I'm here to find. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and this is not where I belong. So when the walls come falling down on me, and when I'm lost in the current of a raging sea, I have this blessed assurance holding me. All I know is I. Oh. 
stop to contemplate that what they sang about that uh, that no matter where we've been no matter what we've done no matter what shame you might carry with you which he has released by the way through the cross he loves you and one of the principal things they talk about in alpha which is the course that we've had for folks who are seeking uh, seeking answers about questions of life and questions of faith is that uh, if you're to boil the entire gospel message down, it's that he loves you so much. May you know that today. Whatever you brought to church with you today, may you know that. And let us pray. And so, Lord God, from that vantage point of knowing how much you love us from on high, we come today to praise you, to praise you for your goodness, Lord God, when we think of the word morality, when we think about doing right, you are the standard. You brought these traits, Lord, from on high to us and distributed them to us by your Holy Spirit. We praise you for your plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says it's a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. In a spiritual sense, Lord, even as we go through the trials and struggles of this life, we can know, Lord God, that truly you have a marvelous plan for our lives. And we praise you for your power. Lord God, the other night there was a thunderstorm with lightning, just a hint of the power that you have, Lord God. People sometimes can be a little frightened of thunderstorms. But Lord God, we don't need to be frightened of you we need to revere you. You love us, as we just talked about. Maybe a little healthy fear because of how powerful you are. But Lord God, mainly love and reverence. Which is why we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord, for the diligence that you give us in every season of life. Lord, when I think of diligence this morning, I think of David Ankney, Lord, who has uh, been running 100 miles and has pretty much finished things, in, things up this morning. Lord, I think about also the diligence of those, too, who, who've had to 
endure the loss of somebody they love, Lord, and to carry on day by day, to, to battle through illness, Lord God, and to continue to have faith. Lord, those are also gifts of diligence that you, you give to us. We give you thanks, Lord, that you give us a burden for other people. Lord, the prayer vigil is all about having burdens for other people. And we give you thanks today, Lord, for family and friends. And Lord, for those friends who feel like family. And Lord, we want to stop and pause for a moment as we think about our lives in this last week and just give you quiet and personal thanksgivings for what you may have done. Lord God, as we thank you, we also must confess that we are less than perfect, that as the theologians tell us, we are still capable of sinning. And so, Lord, we confess those sins of this past week from the quiet of our hearts. Lord, we thank you for the assurance of forgiveness, which is what the cross is all about. We thank you for the transformation that you are working in us as believers and followers of you, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit that you have gifted to us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with intercessory prayers for other people. Lord, this morning we pray for our brother Doug Runyon, the longtime pastor of this church who is awaiting a pacemaker uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we know, Lord, from Kim's reports that he is bored and he is walking the halls. And so, Lord, we would pray that that procedure would go successfully and that in doing so, his heart would be back in rhythm. We continue to pray for the Pence family, Lord, as Larry's memorial service was this past week, as they continue to mourn. For the Cosmo family, Lord, there's a loss that occurred also in that family this week. We pray, Lord, for all those who mourn the Jones family, for the Emory family, for, for others, Lord, for whom perhaps the event of that loss is, is not as immediate as it has been for others lately. But Lord, the sting is still there whenever anniversary dates or songs or, or TV shows or whatever it is comes on that reminds, reminds that person of their loved one. Be with them in those special moments, we pray. Lord, we uh, want to lift up Noah. Jenny Zinga's uh, son, Lord, as he's having a procedure coming up in a cath lab to postpone what would be a fifth open heart surgery for this young man. We pray, Lord, that that cath, uh, cath, cath procedure would be successful, that surgery can be postponed. Lord, uh, from the EPC, we want to pray for a commissioned lay pastor up in, uh, in Leicester, or Leicester, New York, uh, David Missel, Lord, who is recovering from a fractured hip and his wife, uh, who is recovering from a serious heart attack, all taking place within the same amount of time. Thinking about, Lord, what we're talking about in the sermon today, that uh, for those who are placed in leadership positions in the church, sometimes the trials seem to increase. And it seems like it has for, for this couple. And so we lift up and pray for them, Lord. We pray, Lord, as your scripture tells us to do for our leaders, for President Biden, Lord, for, for our state senators from Ohio and Pennsylvania, Lord, for those serving in the, in the House of Representatives from these two states as well, Lord, for those serving, Lord, in government at the state level, both in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and, Lord, for those serving all the way down to the, to the township or borough level, thinking of Ginny Zinga from our church who's serving on the Board of Supervisors for Pulaski Township now. Lord, give them wisdom, and we pray especially for those who are Christians that you would give them exceptional influence, Lord, in uh, crafting legislation or, or having a Christian voice heard in the halls of power. We pray, Lord, for revival in this nation, for we know, Lord, it is desperately needed, for the hunger of your Holy Spirit to come upon so many people that they would cry out to you. These are the prayers that come to my mind, Lord, but there are many others that people brought with them today from this church family and those who are visiting as well. And so, Lord God, we 
We ask now that you would hear these petitions for, for ourselves or intercessory prayers for others that we care about from the quiet of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing every single one of those prayers as we remember the model for prayer that you taught us in Scripture, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm well, trying to believe we're coming now to the fifth message in our sermon series. And as uh, we begin this one this morning, I just want to share with you something you probably already know, that it doesn't take much TV viewing to see that, uh, that uh, comedians and pundits will, will often take uh, very great joy in slamming Christianity. You see this happen way too often on television all the time. And in some cases, the reason why they're, they're poking fun at Christianity is because of, because of some of those televangelists who are out there. Uh, Jimmy Buffett sang about them having bad hair and dimples. Um, I remember that. But, uh, but what they see is kind of this hypocrisy with them in which, uh, which they're proclaiming to be humble servants and yet have private jets and mega mansions and, and everything else. And so, you know, as people look at this form of, quote, Christianity, it's very important that you and I project what true Christianity is all about in terms of, in terms of our attitudes towards people and towards, towards uh, how we advertise our faith, uh, who we support, um, how we serve, all those things. This is the fifth message then in the sermon series that we're calling A View from the Top, in which we have looked at Jesus' last uh, week on earth before his crucifixion and his resurrection, and uh, the things that he's taught his, and the actions that he's taken uh, as described in Luke chapter 20, which is where we've been focusing the first four weeks of this series. Today we're going to be once again going back to Luke chapter 20, the very end of it, verses 45 through 47, and we're sl finally sliding into uh, to Luke chapter 21. And uh, what you're going to see in here this morning is this contrast that takes place. Uh, Jesus has been teaching in the temple courts, so again, this is a Tuesday or a Wednesday before he's arrested. Uh, and uh, he's been teaching in the temple courts, and uh, he has had encounters with the, with the religious leaders, and now he points out something about the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, you remember, the folks who are folks who, who study the Old Testament scriptures, interpret it, and try to apply it to people's lives. He contrasts that with a widow, uh, and as we read the original Greek language that the, the New Testament is written in, we find out about this widow that, uh, that not only was she poor, but she was hardworking. I mean, she worked so hard just to, to make the meager ends meet that she did. And so for those of you who like to follow along in your own Bibles, we're going to Luke chapter 20, verses 45 through 47, then sliding right into chapter 21 this morning. And here's what uh, the gospel writer Luke was inspired to say as he records the events of Jesus' ministry. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Then we go on to, to chapter 21. Again, the same instance. He's still in the temple courts. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. May God bless the reading of this, his holy word today. And would you pray with me, please? 
And so, Lord God, we uh, want to pray today that you would help to translate this, Lord, to, to our lives today. And Lord, we would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we have looked at the, so far what Jesus has taught us about having, uh, having one authority and one authority only that we look to. We question other authorities, but we should never question Jesus. Uh, he is talking about having a sense of urgency in terms of, in terms of sharing his faith. We've looked at that too. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the issues of church and state and what Jesus had to say about that. And last week we had this, this beautiful treatise that Jesus did on the afterlife. Well, today, what we're going to look at is this very real idea of making your faith attractive to other people, um, how some people don't make the faith attractive, and how we can make the faith attractive. And what it's going to involve today, we're going to take a look at, is, is three approaches from this text today. The first approach is this, to be humble in the ways in which you express your faith, to be humble in the ways that you express your faith. Yes, the reason why we pray for revival in this country, as you just heard me do a couple of moments ago, is because, as I talked about a couple of weeks ago in a sermon, that if the trends continue by 2070, the Christian worldview will be a minority view here in this country. And part of the reason that it is becoming a minority view is that some people are kind of helping that trend along with their behavior. If the Pharisees had existed today, they would be helping the trend along of people walking away from the faith because of their behavior. Jesus calls them out in verse 46, and he says, he says this specifically. They like to walk around in flowing robes and like to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. As I look back at this and, and saw some various different theologians' uh, takes on this, uh, Howard Marshall talked about the flowing robes, and he said... What these guys dressed themselves up like was to look like kings, so they could kind of prance around looking like kings. Um, William Hendrickson talked about the, the fact that they liked to be greeted in the marketplace and said that, uh, that basically they wanted to be called rabbi all the time so that they could show themselves to be superior to, uh, to everybody else. And finally, uh, John Calvin talking about the important seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at the banquets, banquets was this was their ambition. To, uh, to show themselves off, to, to show how, how great they were, to show their prestige by, by all that they had and, and who they were. So how does this translate to today, to, to you and I today? Well, we talked about televangelists at the beginning of the message, and, and maybe they didn't wear, don't wear flowing robes, but, uh, but they let their, their, their wares, what they have, uh, be their showpiece. And I was shocked, actually, to read some of the net worth of some of the popular televangelists who were out there. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, worth $760 million. Wow. Uh, Joel Olstein, worth $100 million. That's his net worth. Uh, Benny Hinn, uh, net worth of $70 million. I contrast that with somebody like Rick Warren. Uh, Rick Warren uh, wrote that book that many people read called The Purpose Driven Life. Matter of fact, a lot of churches went through back in the, uh, the 90s, the 40 Days of Purpose. So he would have made a lot of money from that you know, best-selling book next to the Bible in terms of Christian books. But uh, he decided to become a reverse tither. You know, we're told to tithe our 10%. Well, he's tithing 90% of what he gets in proceeds from the Purpose Driven Life and living on the 10%. And so, you know, that's one thing this is speaking about. But this also, I think, um, you know, it's not a put-down of, of, of making income. Um, it's, it's the fact that uh, if you're trying to attract people to, to Christianity, uh, you don't do so in a way that makes you look hypocritical. And uh, that's unfortunately what some of the televangelists do, is they look a little hypocritical. And that's actually what Jesus does, is he calls out the Pharisees for being hypocritical. This section I read this morning in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 20, it's part of a larger section, actually, that's located in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, he actually, Jesus spells out what's referred to in the Gospel of Matthew as the seven woes. And it's not woe, 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 as in background singers from a rock band. It's, uh, it's woes and curses upon the Pharisees. Now, here's an example of one that he says in Matthew chapter 23. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, calling them that. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, they tithe, 
but you've neglected the important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without, without neglecting the former, doing your tithing and, and, and everything else. But this also translates down to us, not just those out there who are on television all the time broadcasting about the Christian faith. It also translates down, down to us as, as church leaders as well. It translates down to me as a pastor and to all of you who are elders uh, in the church, spiritual leaders in the church. What this is saying to, to, to you and I is that, is that we also should not put on airs, feeling superior about any position that we have within the church. Jesus actually becomes the model for how we are to, to be in leadership within the church. Remember what Jesus said to the apostles back in Matthew chapter 20. He said this, uh, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for many people. Fortunately, or guys in the session, I have to tell you, unfortunately, God has a way to keep us humble um, as spiritual leaders within the church. There's a number of ways that he does, he does so. First of all, you would all agree that we are all subject to temptations, aren't we? Still, to this day. Uh, the, uh, the Apostle Peter, or the Apostle Paul, I should say, was subject to temptations. And he talked about this in his second letter to the, to the Corinthian church. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Then there is the, the very fact that, uh, and mentioned that in our prayer this morning for, for David Missile up in, in New York City, New York State, I should say, that... Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed it as elders, or those who have served elders, elders in the church, but sometimes when you take on that leadership position, that servant heart that you're supposed to have, sometimes it seems like the trials increase in your life uh, just, to, just to keep you humble, just to realize that you need to rely upon the Lord. And then there's this reality as well. Uh, Christianity has declined uh, within the nation. Back in the 1950s, you're a pastor, you're an elder, boy, you're respected. Uh, not so much today. Today, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, people almost you know, are sorry that you're, a, that you're a pastor or you're an elder in the church. And then for every single Christian, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're serving in leadership in your church, and we're all called to be ministers uh, out there into the world. For all of us, another th reason why we need to be humble is, is the very fact that we are Christians is not because of anything we did, right? It's nothing that we did. It's everything that God did for us in getting a hold of our hearts. And, and, and Paul talked about this in his letter to the Roman church. He said this in Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so if you want to make Christianity attractive out there in the world, one way to do so is to, is to demonstrate humility because this is a humbling life that we live. Um, but thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit is working in and through us in this humbling life that we live. Here's number two, a second approach. And it really ties back into, again, how Christianity is broadcast out there in the world. To be wary of those who use their faith to exploit others. And this is where Jesus really didn't like what the Pharisees were doing at all. And uh, he found what they were doing was kind of disgusting, actually. And verse 47 uh, talks about what, was, what he saw them doing. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men should be punished most severely. So these guys were respected members of the community, these Pharisees. And because they were respected members of the community, uh, when a husband died leaving a widow... Uh, they would come in as trustees. Yeah, they come in as trustees. And they do a number of different things as I read and researched this. One was they would charge exorbitant fees for these widows to be able to manage the estates, just to you know, plug their coffers full. Or they would convince the widows that they need to give everything that they have practically um, to the work of the temple, knowing that they will be blessed by this is what, is what they would say. And, um, and Jesus just really called that out. He, didn't, he thought that was very, very heinous on their part. But there was something even more heinous that, uh, that Howard Marshall 
And uh, I believe it was William Hendrickson pointed out in their Bible commentary on this passage. And it really comes down to this idea of lengthy prayers. Um, if you think my prayers go a little bit long, the lengthy prayers that were being talked about, uh, sometimes the Pharisees would pray for three hours, three hours straight. You want to hang out with me Sunday afternoon and pray for three hours? Actually, it's kind of the prayer vigil, isn't it, Cindy? We could probably, but it's only for an hour. We're, each, we're taking turns. But uh, praying for three hours. But here's what they would do. they pray specifically about the widows. They would P-R-A-Y for the widows so that they could P-R-E-Y, pray upon them. And Jesus thought this was the most horrible thing in the world. So how does that translate to today? I think you can see where this is going. We have individuals out there who claim to be Christians, who are televangelists, who are taking poor widows, poor men at home by themselves, widowers, and trying to take as much of their money as they can to, to promote supposedly Christianity, but their lifestyles, their lifestyles. And we've seen so many examples of this that have taken place in the world, sadly, uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the Christian songs that we sing on a regular basis, we sing songs from Hillsong Church. And uh, they're anointed songs, and we'll never stop singing those songs. They're wonderful. But you've read yourself probably how in the last couple of years, Hillsong Church itself has come under scandal for the way it's handling its finances, taking the tithes and offerings from all of those individuals who are diligently trying to support the work of the church and using it for lavish things like, like renting private jets for themselves. Literally did that is what uh, is what the resigned pastor of that church did, it's paying for expensive hotels, buying elaborate gifts, doing all these things out of uh, out of the, the tithes and offerings uh, given given to other people, and so it's um, it's something that we need to 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 be aware of. Jesus is calling out the Pharisees for a similar thing, and so what I talked about at the start, we need to be aware of who we're supporting in the Christian ministry. Because if we want to attract people to this, we don't want to support those who are hypocrites or are just doing this to, to, to make money for themselves. So how then does this circle around and translate back to us? That's where, the, that's where chapter 21 and the third approach for making, making your faith attractive to others comes into play. And it's this. The third approach is to be sacrificial in how you live out your Christian life. And so now we have this contrast that Jesus sets up. Now, I just want to set the stage for you. Jesus has been, been teaching for, for that whole day on the Tuesday, and I'm not sure if this goes into Wednesday or not, but, but uh, teaching that whole Tuesday in the temple courts. Now, what I read in researching this, and I did not know this before, is he taught in a section of the court known as uh, the temple, known as the women's court. And in the women's court were these 13 receptacles. I never knew this before. These 13 receptacles in which people would come in and give their donations to the church in one of those 13 receptacles, uh, various different parts of taking care of the temple. Uh, this, this receptacle would be for, for this idea. This would be for that idea. Maybe this keeps up the, the brass plates or you know, whatever it might be. They're dropping this in. Jesus is sitting down now, having taught and observes this, and we see this in chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. As, they, uh, as, they, as he looked up from sitting down, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting in two very small copper coins. Now let's uh, translate that to what she would have given today. So we learned a couple of weeks ago that a denarius, which is a, which is a, a measure of, of a coinage, a coin, a denarius was basically one day's wage for the average laborer back in the first century Middle East. The two copper coins, one sixty-fourth of a denarius, mere pennies she was throwing in. And yet Jesus says this in verses three and four. He says this, he says, I tell you the truth. And when he says, I tell you the truth, that means pay attention to this. As a matter of fact, some scholars believe the apostles gathered closer to him when he said this. I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. One commentator put it this way. Most people give out of their overflow. I'm gonna take care of my needs, I'm also going to take care of my wants. And then if there's anything left over, I'll give to the work of God. 
This woman, though, did not do that. She gave all she had and trusted God even for her next meal. Now, this is not telling you and I that, that we need to give until we're destitute. Um, the, the guys on TV with bad hair and dimples might tell you that. The bald man up here is not going to tell you that, okay? Uh, it's not telling you to do that. It is saying, though, however, to be sacrificial in terms of your giving. Uh, maybe you forego that uh, second carton of ice cream in order to, to give to your church. But then also, with regard to this, you also give of your time. Uh, your time can be a tithe as well. The, giving time to your church with the gifts that you have. Uh, lending your talents to the church, uh, whether it be frying fish, you know, or, uh, or, or whether it might be fixing something in the manse, as uh, Chuck Bell did for me this week, and also Bob Bell, Bell did as well, whether it might be gathering up sticks, you know, before it snows. All those different things are ways that you can contribute to, to, to the life of the church. All these thoughts came together, actually, in what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter, chapter 2. Uh, Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 2. He said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the very same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to, the, to, to death, even death on a cross. You see it all laid out there. Humility, not putting on airs uh, of any kind and serving others is what it's all about. As I was working on this message, I recall back to my, one of my first classes in seminary, uh, Frank James History of Christianity I class. And uh, I always remember Frank James um, stood up and, and read something from, I'm not sure if it was the first century, second century, or third century, but it was what attracted people to the Christian faith back in those early centuries in the, uh, in the early part of the church. Uh, the, the letter that he wrote implied that it wasn't cathedrals that attracted people. What attracted them was this. They watched how how people within the church cared for each other. But not only that, and this was the one that really got to me, they, they also saw how they cared for people outside the church. The writers of this said how they care for somebody like me, even though I don't go to their church. And so that's how we make Christianity attractive. That's what Jesus is talking about here. We're, hum you're, we're humble in terms of how we project ourselves out there in the world. We don't support those who, who are making this into a sham or who are, who are making people say that Christianity is just a bunch of hypocrites. But we are sacrificial, too, in giving of our time and our talent and our treasure. That's not my view. That's Jesus' view. That's a view from the top. To God be the glory. And pray with me, please. <coughs> so, Lord God, today... We pray, Lord, that in our interactions out there in the world, that you would give us humble hearts. Lord, hearts to know needs and to meet those needs. And Lord God, I also want to pray for the individual who might be here or, or watching online, either right now live or, or live at the 1030 service or, or maybe later on watching it on YouTube who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. That last set of verses about what you did for us, uh, recorded for us in Philippians chapter 2, I pray, Lord, that it would really speak to their hearts today. And that, Lord, they would realize that when it's speaking to their hearts, it's, uh, it's you knocking on the door of their hearts, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that they would open that door to, to declare what we Christians believe, that they might even say it out loud. I don't know and understand all of this, Lord God, but I know that you, Jesus, are God come down to earth, that you died on the cross to atone, to make up for my sins, to bridge the gap between God the Father and, and me. And uh, 
I don't know and understand it all, but I want to follow you, Jesus, as my Savior all the days of my life. Lord God, we, we stand in awe of what you did for us. Lord, as we conclude our time of worship today, we want to declare how overwhelmed we are in this season of Lent by your love for us. That's in your name, Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing. of the awe of his presence this whole Lenten season as we move into Palm Sunday next weekend and after that Easter Sunday and the celebration of the resurrection. Go in peace. Go in love. And smile. And walk. And sing. 
and dance with Jesus today. And all God's people said, amen.